appreciate very much everyone's presence tonight for our Bible class, and we certainly appreciate the fine message that uh, Steve Johnson has brought us. I'm reminded, Steve, when you were bringing that lesson on predestination of the gospel preacher who was debating a Calvinist, and the Calvinist was advocating predestination, and he had an apple in his hand. He told the audience, I was predestined before the world was by God to eat this apple. And he set the apple down on the side of the pulpit. The gospel preacher just reached up there, got it, started eating it, and didn't say a word. So that pretty well signified that fellow had it wrong. He refuted without even words to refute, just the actions themselves. But that's a good lesson, and it's so sad that so many people think they're following God when they believe such a thing. It actually makes God out a monster when you think about it. And uh, I don't serve the God that is monstrous as that God is. who says you're going to hell whether you like it or not. And you can be the biggest hellion on earth, but you're going to heaven and whether you want to go or not. None of that makes any sense. And you might think about that as we go back to our study now of Adam and Eve, of course. And think about that as, and, and apply Calvinistic ideas to Adam and Eve. That didn't make any sense much at all when you think about God and his Calvinistic sovereignty for ordaining that Adam and Eve would do what they did. Doesn't make a lot of sense. And also very interesting to think about Satan. How did he become what he was since we serve a sovereign God? How would God ever put somebody like that or into existence? Let's just all so I say somebody, some spirit or whatever. But nevertheless, the scripture makes it clear that when man wills to read the Bible as the word of God, he learns. He doesn't read the Bible, doesn't want to learn, he won't. And that's by his own free will. And when he learns the will of God for his life, Adam exemplifies that, and so does Eve. He is blessed when he loves and obeys the truth, but when he violates the truth by his own choice, then, of course, he's separated from God. Now, we were talking about Adam and Eve and drawing some lessons from the account in the book of Genesis. And I started last week right at the end of the fast period to talk about Adam and Eve following their sins. We already mentioned, and I will be repeating a few things. First of all, we had noted that they came to know when they ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, that they were naked. Um, this caused them to make an effort, and our next point, point two, uh, to cover themselves by making aprons of fig leaves. And then the next point is they, being guilty and ashamed, try to hide themselves from the very presence of God. And this causes us to realize what it is when one is made to understand this lost condition. Notice these two were realizing their lost condition. And it put them in a state of guilt. And the guilt made them ashamed, made them aware of their nakedness. Well, the Hebrew word atonement means actually to cover. Well, they were attempting to cover themselves once they were made aware of their nakedness and they were ashamed. But it didn't work with them because. They didn't follow God's will. They didn't know God's will as to how to properly cover themselves. We know, bringing it over to the Christian dispensation, that there are many people who try to cover themselves with God as far as their sins today are concerned. But they will not be immersed in water by the authority of Christ into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to obtain the mission of sins. 
Yet the New Testament is clear coming from various directions that one does not become free from sin until as a believing penitent person, they are immersed in water for the remission of their sins. That is, they're baptized into Christ, Galatians 3, 26 and 27. And notice they are, then, if you please, clothed with Christ. Again, I cite Galatians 3, 27. And then, this is our third point, they constantly seek and rejoice in the continual presence of God as they walk in the light as he is in the light, having fellowship one with another, while the blood of Jesus Christ continues to cleanse them from all sin, verse John 1, 7. Now, I say that here because you can see the very process that unfolded completely, well, when it came down to the time of Christ and the time of the gospel to be revealed, how that there was a need to cover man's sin. Now, we understand, as I said earlier, that God knew how to cover the shame of Adam and Eve. They recognized their shame. They recognized they were not fit to walk with God anymore. They didn't know how properly cover their shame. It's interesting, too, looking at Adam, that God gave Adam a very pointed examination. Notice he asked questions. Well, God's omniscient. He didn't need to know something that he didn't know unless Adam told him. But he asked him, he says, where art thou? And he said, then who told thee that thou wast naked? And then he says, hast thou eaten of the tree? Well, as I said, God knew the answers. These questions were for the benefit of Adam. These questions forced Adam to think about what he had done and the condition his sin put him in, again, causing him to even more realize the enormity of sin, how terrible it really is. Well, I think for us, since that was written a four time for your learning and my learning, Romans 15, verse 4, as we study God's word, properly study it, 2 Timothy 2, and verse 15, then we all, to keep in mind that through the word of God, God is actually examining us. Now we can stop God's examination of ourselves by simply ignoring what's in the Bible by not studying it or us turning a deaf ear to whatever we see that the Bible teaches. But when we study the Bible, it's not strictly for information purposes. It's to make us think. The Bible is designed to make us think and to think about ourselves. So God is asking us about our lives. God is forcing us, as we study the Bible, use the brains that he gave us, so to speak, to think about ourselves in the light of what he's doing forcing us to think about what we've done and about our condition. And you'll notice, if you want to think of it from the standpoint of law, that God uh, has charged us with sin. We did it. We can't blame it on anybody else. Others may have had a hand in our breaking God's law, but nevertheless, we individually and personally chose to break God's law. Now, God's charged with the sin, Romans 3, verse 23. Now, we're either going to try to say, no, I'm not guilty, or else we're going to say, your charge is exactly right. I am a sinner. I did do it on my own volition. I wanted to do it when I did it. Now, what am I supposed to do about it? Now, when you look at Adam, that's what he's caused to realize about himself. And these questions God put to him 
caused him to think about that, and no doubt Eve also. So you see then that God had come to be with Adam and Eve. Remember, they heard the sound of him in the garden at his usual time of coming in the cool of the day. But now again, notice what we said earlier. Adam and Eve were hidden among the trees of the garden. The realization on their part of their guilt because they had sinned against God had the same effect on then it does on people today when people are honest with themselves, with God, and with the Word of God as it forces them to see themselves for what they are. It causes them to seek to hide from God. Now, since all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23, and we know from a cursory study of the New Testament alone that the great majority of people who are accountable to God for their sins aren't going to change, then there, there's a host of people who are trying to hide among the trees from God today. They try to make excuse not to face up to their personal responsibility in having sinned against God. Many others do it by saying, well, there is no God and so on down the line, every other false way they possibly can. And that tells us too, even as did with Adam, that oftentimes God comes to be with men, but men are not in their place, just like Adam. Where are they? So often, and that of course is because of sins, they are ashamed to meet with God. They try to hide themselves amongst the trees of the garden, such as people try today to do. They make every kind of excuse under the sun to justify themselves. And even if they admit to sin, they try to justify themselves and not doing just exactly what the Bible says they ought to do to be saved. But the Bible's word of God. So when they reject what the Bible says, they're just casting God's word back in his face. Now, when Adam and Eve made themselves, we've already mentioned several times, made for themselves aprons of fig leaves, we can see a great lesson in this. I mentioned earlier, they were trying to cover their shame, and they were full of shame because of their sin, having eaten of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But notice that their human efforts to deal with the problem of the consequences of sin just didn't work. Now, they must have thought it worked, but God knew better. So they became good representatives, or they are good representatives, of thousands upon thousands of similar efforts by people, and the Bible records a number of them. Let's look at some of them, even in the Old Testament. When Joseph's brethren lied to their father about Joseph, well, that was just but a fig leaf is all it was. When King Saul, with his failure to obey God and destroy the Malachites, lied to Samuel, remember he tried to blame the people for what he failed to do, and he sought to hide behind a religious guise. Well, here I brought all these home, best of the flocks to offer them sacrifice. Well, if Everything had been acceptable. just doesn't make any difference what you believe. You so you said, Sir, that would have been all right for him to do that. He didn't get away with that. There in the Old Testament, we see that didn't work. I guess we could call all these non-availing fig leaves. Uh, when you come to David, King David, 
you'll see how he schemed to have Uriah go to his own home. All that led to finally Uriah's murder. Well, these were nothing but pointless and vain efforts to cover David's terrible sin with Bathsheba. What can we call these? Fig leaves, that's all they were, fig leaves. And every denominational body in the world is nothing but a fig leaf. Every false religion in the world is nothing but a fig leaf. Only God, through Jesus Christ, upon the terms of the gospel of Christ, God's power to save us, Romans 1, 16. And of course, as it is revealed in the Bible, can deal with the problem of the consequences of sin. Human beings have no such authority, and they do not have any ability any more than Adam and Eve had done what they should have done in covering their shame with the fig leaves. There must be some significance to the fact that God took away the fig leaves and made them coats of animal skin. For one thing, he had to skin those animals, and that meant he had to kill those animals. And innocent lives of animals were sacrificed to cover the nakedness and the shame brought about by sin and Adam these lives. And thus we have pictured here atonement. You have so many thousands of years ago, in a very vague way, but really it's very, I guess you'd say, teaching way to get a point across, good teaching point, that here lives had to be lost, that they could have their sins covered. And, of course, you have in the Bible concerning Christ. When John saw him coming to his baptism. He said, behold, the Lamb of God taketh away the sins of the world. And thus the blood of Christ was shed for the remission of our sins. We're clothed by Christ when we believe and obey the gospel from the heart and are baptized into Christ. We put on Christ. Maybe something should be said about the voice of the serpent. I've mentioned this from time to time over the years, haven't lately. The voice of the serpent. What was the nature, what was the nature of that voice? And we might consider the when, the nature of it and the when of that voice. Well, I'm quite confident that that voice was a very pleasing voice to Eve. It is heard at times most advantageous to the serpent or to Satan. And it can be heard even where not ordinarily expected. And we might note by looking at what Satan said that it usually presents insinuating questions. And in doing so, notice uh, that Satan was attempting to remove fear from Eve. And notice that he offered a reward. And there's always an element in most cases at least, an element of truth in what Satan said. But look at what happens if you believe him, if you accept his words. It brings grief, it brings 
pain, it brings suffering, it brings sorrow, it brings anxiety and worry. Everybody who listens to it and is moved by it. And oftentimes, it causes innocent people, people to suffer. And as we said a little while ago, it causes people to want to hide from God. If you listen to the voice of Satan, you won't want to be close to God. Well, now, how do we know today when we're listening to the voice of Satan? First of all, when he is tempted, that means we're solicited to disregard or to violate God's word. Anytime uh, we think we might do that or we're well, just tempted to do it, then just say, that's Satan talking to me, just like he. Well, I don't mean he's actually saying it, but if there is that temptation, then what else could it be as far as the source of it? God is certainly not going to solicit us to break his own laws. James tells us that. And we do know that Satan is a roaring lion goes by seeking whom he may devour. He's never devoured a, a free moral agent, a human being ever, if that person didn't want him to. Wasn't drawn away of his own lust, violated God's will to gratify them, even as Eve did. Also, when he's tempted to violate his own conscience, to violate his own conscience. Our consciences either excuse us or accuses us. Paul writes about that in Romans. We have a standard of conduct. On Sunday morning in class, we're talking about ethical conduct. Well, you can't even talk about ethical conduct if you don't have a code of conduct. Well, we do. We have the perfect law of liberty, the gospel system, the faith. And it tells us how to live. And when we know it being God's word, that we honestly have believed and obeyed it, our conscience, which is the highest court of our being, tells us to feel good, we're all right. But our conscience pricks us or accuses us or hurts us, as we might say today, when we know we violated the will of heaven. So we need to understand that we don't need to violate our conscience. Well, what do we need to do? We need to make sure our intellect is properly informed with the right and divided word of God and that we are in compliance with whatever God has asked us to do or commanded us to do. And that way, our conscience will accuse us. But until we are sure that what we're doing or not doing is according to the will of God, then we don't violate our conscience. When you violate your conscience, you're helping to sear your conscience. That's what Paul talks about when he talks about false teachers, 1 Timothy 4. He said, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared the hot iron. You ever wonder how that happens? They departed from the faith. Well, you can't depart from what you did not, uh, you were not a part of. So they were Christians. They heard and believed the gospel. No reason to believe at all. They weren't saved because the Bible says they departed from the faith. But it tells us how. Their conscience became seared. That is, it, it, it couldn't work right. It didn't accuse when it should have accused, and it uh, accused uh, or excused when it should have accused. They ruined the conscience. So we need to understand that when we know what the truth of God is and we do it and then we do not repent of it, we're just going through the process of searing our conscience. Every time that we hear the truth, know it's the truth. It's God's word. It's his will for us, and we know it, but we won't obey it. We make it easier the next time to reject it. And on and on we could go until at some point, 
our conscience doesn't bother us at all. We've already figured out a way to justify violating God's will and thinking God will accept it. Also, we might consider that the voices of the serpent is when uh, we're tempted to disregard parental judgment. Now, God doesn't expect any child when he's old enough to understand, to obey his parents when they're trying to get him to sin against God. We're talking about parents who are godly parents, rearing their children, they're nurturing and admonition of the Lord. They're living a godly life and they're teaching their children, disciplining their children, training their children, as the word of God says parents ought to. But then a child or children won't listen. They won't pay attention to the wisdom of their parents or others because they're determined to do as they please. Now, we would do well to spend a lot of time reading the Old Testament, never go to the New Testament, see how much is said about children who won't listen to their parents. We're determined to do as they please, no matter how godly their parents are. So we're simply listening to the voice of Satan when we disregard parental judgment and instructions when they're in harmony with the Bible. Another point is we're listening to the voice of Satan when we're inclined, as many people are, to argue the, put this in quotes, to argue the, quote, littleness of a thing. I don't know how many times I've heard people saying, well, that's such a little thing. Why be all bent out of shape over it? Well, was it a little thing when that uh, uh, person touched the ark? Can't call his name right now. Husband, I got it. Well, it seems a little in man's view, but the law of Moses is very distinct. Only the Levites, only the priests, could carry the Ark of the Covenant under the law of Moses. After all, he was just standing an ox cart, which it was set on. It was a new ox cart. They were doing the best they could with that fig leaf. But when the ox stumbled, he reached his hand up. Steady it, and God killed him. It's a little thing. Wasn't God being all picky? Well, you know, you know, Uzzah was was sincere. But God killed that sincere man because they were not paying attention to the authority of God as to how to transport the ark and who was to do it. And so today we find people talking about, well, I just. It just seems like a little matter to say that uh, nobody go to heaven but those who are baptized. Or you want to fuss about the kind of music to use in the worship of God. Well, isn't it just good to get people to believe in God and believe in Jesus Christ? Isn't that, isn't that something? Why be so picky on all these things? Well, you got to remember when you go back to Adam and Eve, God was rather picky. He'd ever eat of the fruit of every one of these trees in the garden, but one. When you eat of that one, and the day you eat thereof, thou shalt surely die. Just one single solitary sin, because there was only one single solitary positive law God gave. It. And you see what happened if you believe the Bible to be the Word of God. So the littleness argument doesn't hold water with me. It should with anybody else. And it's a good way, though, that Satan has taught a lot of people nowadays. Of course, another one is, a, is always will be one that people have to fight. We're free moral agents, and we all are. And that is when we're concerned about pleasing ourselves rather than about pleasing God. A lot of people are like that. They get all bit out of shape because something was done they did not like. It didn't suit them but things can be done to the precious blood body of Christ 
And they don't get too concerned about that because they didn't care one way or the other to begin with. Then there are those who are inclined to say, well, everybody else is doing it. I've all thought about that when you come to Adam and Eve. <laughs> they could very well say that. The only two human beings on earth. One believed and obeyed a lie and then just gave it to the other, and there they are. Who are they going to blame? Well, they tried, didn't they? Adam said, the woman I gave to me, she did give me, and I did eat. So really, if you hadn't given me that woman, I wouldn't have sinned. So it was God's fault. Well, men haven't changed, have they? And then, of course, there's one that says, nobody will ever find out about this. I'm sure some of that went on in King David's mind regarding Bathsheba. But God knows. One time, and I may have told this before, but it's a classic. We had rules regulations when I was directing the school over at Austin. I was prevailed upon by a set of elders to accept this young man in and really didn't want to, but they wanted me to said, try to give him help, blah, 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 as usually it goes. So I said, okay, we'll, we'll take him in on probation. Well, we didn't allow smoking. And uh, he's supposed to have quit. And uh, it turned out he was still smoking after about half the semester was over. So I called him in the office. And I directly confronted him with it. And <laughs> he is still humorous, except it wasn't humorous. He said, well, I, I just smoke a little bit. And I, he said, no, nobody else knows about it. I said, well, first of all, they do, or I wouldn't be talking to you. But I said, uh, if nobody else really did know about it, God knows about it. And he looked right back at me and said, yeah, but he ain't going to tell nobody. I said, go get your books and leave. Anybody that's that bad shape needs some help. But then we look around at so many people. And they virtually take the same position. Well, nobody's going to find out. God knows. It really is saying, I don't care if God knows as long as anybody else finds out. And then another is... Um, when he wants to argue, well, you know, that's not as bad as whatever it is. And that happens all the time. Now, it's strange as adults and parents, we'll see this among our children trying to justify themselves on frivolous matters and sometimes not so frivolous. But then grown adults will use these same things or they'll be running in their minds trying to justify themselves in their own sins. Well, that's just the voice of Satan. I can tell you, you can get by with it. You put it over on God. But everyone I've mentioned here, and there are others, it'd be the same way with them. There's just death and destruction in the voice of the serpent. That's all there is to it. This is the testimony of God's good word. But it's also the testimony of millions of people who have listened to it. I don't know how far we can get with this, but I want you to, I'm gonna, you might want to make a list of some of this. Because Adam, as we pointed out several times since we started, was a and is a type of Christ, Romans 5, verse 14. A type of Christ. So let me, if you've got some paper there, make a column, uh, two columns. Over one, right Adam, and over the other column, right Christ. And notice that under the column that has Adam written over it, Luke 3 and verse 38, Luke 3, 38, calls Adam the son of God. And we're all familiar with John chapter 3, verse 16. It calls Christ. Son of God. So you can write that just parallel to one another under the appropriate or in the appropriate column. 
looking at Adam again, Adam was uniquely, and by that I mean miraculously, brought forth by God. He created him from the dust of the ground. The body, that is. When you look at Jesus, he too was uniquely brought forth by God in the virgin birth. Adam was the head of the physical race. Christ is the head of the spiritual race. Genesis chapter 5 and verse 2 tells us that God named Adam. That is, he received his name from God. Matthew chapter 1 in verse 21 lets us know that Jesus received his name from God. Under Adam, you can see that he was caused to sleep an unnatural sleep. Well, when you look at Jesus, he was caused to sleep an unnatural sleep in the sense of the kind of death he died. It was not as other deaths. First of all, he did no sin. Yet he died on behalf of others and for the benefit of others. Thus he could not be held in the Hadean world. Thus he rose from the dead by his own power. Now you remember in the sleep, when Adam was asleep, he, he, he um, had a bone taken from his side. His side was open. Well, in the death of Christ, what happened? Soldier ran a spear in his side. Concerning Adam, I've already mentioned uh, after his side was open, then they took a rib, or God took a rib from his side. And that was the I'll say the price of Adam's bride. And when it came to Christ in that column, from his side was taken his blood. He shed his blood, price of his bride, Acts 20 and verse 28. In the column under Adam, it was God who presented the bride to Adam. And in the column under Christ, was God who presented the church, the bride of Christ, to Christ. Bible teaches us, and this would be another one under Adam, that Adam loved his bride. Bible teaches us in the column under Christ that Christ loves his bride, the church. The Bible makes it clear under the column with Adam's name above it that Adam was head over Eve. And then the one with Christ above it, we see that Christ is the head of the church. Going back under the column concerning Adam, Eve was subject to Adam. Under the column concerning Christ, the church is subject to Christ. Back under Column concerning Adam. Through Adam, sin entered into the world. Now under the one headed with Christ's name, through Christ's salvation came into the world. Through Adam, there came spiritual death into the world. And through Christ, spiritual life came into the world. Of course, we said already that through Adam, physical death came into the world. All must die. But then through Christ, life is made possible. All men 
who believe, obey the gospel, live faithful lives, will be raised in the final resurrection. Under the column headed with Adam's name, Adam's sin affected many people. I'll just say the many. When it comes to the Lord and that column that has his name at the head of it, the Lord's death affected me. He died for the benefit of all men. Under the column regarding Adam, through Adam came condemnation. Then over to the column with headed by Christ's name, through Christ came justification. And then under the column headed by Adam's name, because of Adam, death reigned. And then under Christ, because of Christ, righteousness reigned. Under Adam, we see in Adam there's disobedience. In column concerning Christ, in Christ was obedience. Then in the column under Adam, this will be our last point here. And Adam sin reigned in death. And then under the column headed by Christ's name, in Christ, grace reigns through righteousness. I might make a suggestion, it's time consuming. But you can go through and see so many things like this in the study of the Old Testament. When we studied the letter to the Hebrews, you had basically this approach, as they pointed out to Jews who knew very well the law of Moses. But they had heard the gospel, believed it, and obeyed it due to persecution. They were considering leaving the New Testament system, going back under the law. Thus, you have the two talked about, compared, contrasted, and so on. Well, that's a good way to study. No wonder then we used to hear the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed, and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. You can see that to a great extent. And the one example of conversion that is of the Ethiopian nobleman. When he read Isaiah 53, he said, Of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or some other man? And it's right after that that the scripture says, Philip began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Another way of saying he preached the gospel. He preached the faith. He preached the word, the seed of the kingdom. And we get an idea about just how a lot of the preaching was done to the Jews, especially in the first century early on. So here again, some wonderful ways of studying the Bible. Those of you who might be thinking about working out lessons later on, you might want to take these two columns and one under the heading of Adam, the other the heading of Christ. Uh, there's enough there to keep a fellow busy a long time preaching. Now, as we come down toward the end, got any questions, go ahead and send them to uh, J.D. He'll bring them up to me here in a minute. But I want to continue with our study of these things concerning Adam, as time allows. And uh, you might take them and even see more lessons than what I've found. But... And that's just the way it is in growth and development and study of the Bible, the right division of the word. So before we close the lesson, I'm going to ask you to go with me to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we're thankful we can be together for the study of thy word, the study about Adam and especially how he is the type of Christ. Be able to review in our own lives the how Satan can approach us and what the voice of Satan actually sounds like. May we fill ourselves with the truth of thy gospel and be able to reject all 
such overtures that Satan makes to get us to sin. Help us to love the truth. Help us to study it right and divide it. Help us above all to be obedient to thee. Bless us, the spring congregation, that we might be pleasing in thy sight. We might love each other and help each other to understand the truth and to live what we understand. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.